We are embarking on a lesson series that will take us through the summer, looking at the most important things that, that God's Word teaches us. And there is nothing more important than our salvation. Jesus said that our salvation is so important that uh, if you gain the whole world, but if you lose your soul, what good would it be for you trying to just simply point out that there is nothing that we can have or be given or be blessed with that is more important than where we will spend eternity. Last week we began by simply looking at what the Hebrew writer wrote to the Christians, uh, the Jewish Christians who are leaving Jesus in droves. Uh, it was getting too hard. It was too challenging. They were tired of people not loving them anymore, talking to them anymore, of their parents not wanting to see them anymore perhaps uh, because they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. But he implored them to not neglect such a great salvation. My friends, in every generation, we need to make again uh, the, the truth known that the greatest thing in this world, the greatest thing to us, is salvation. It is the greatest thing. But we must make it great with our thoughts, our words, our actions, with our life, with what we talk about, with what is important to us. And it seems to me, uh, and, I, and I, only, I only say this simply just you know, from experience of talking to so many people, that salvation does not seem to be as great in some as it is in others. Some people go their entire lives with salvation, the, the fact of their salvation, and they know that their life will never ever be better or be the same. And some, it can just be so old hat, they accept it as it is, but then, eh, I have to still live my life. Well, we need to look at it the way God intends. Now today I want to leave with you uh, a simple study uh, on really just a basic biblical understanding of what salvation is. If you ask a hundred people, what does it mean to be saved? I expect you'll get at least 50 answers that are all different and probably many that aren't even biblical. We need to have a biblical understanding of what it means to be saved anyway, about what salvation means. Well, first of all, we need to, to understand is that the point, the theme of the entire Bible is salvation. From Genesis to Revelation, God's plan that He wrote even before the world began, before He created, has all been about salvation of sinful mankind. That's what this is all about. That's why we're here today. That's why we are living and breathing because God wants to save us and save all mankind. That is where we're going today. Now, Bible students, there's a lot of them in this room and I appreciate you so much. But I think sometimes as Bible students, we have to also admit that there are so many things that we don't know or that we don't understand. There are things in the Bible that are a challenge to you, I expect. So many things that challenge me every time I read them, or every time I try to, to teach them or preach them. And you have to work really hard to find God's meaning, God's truth, God's explanation on things. And so there are things in the Bible that are a challenge to our simple human understanding. Now I'll give you some for instances. For instance, creation. The fact that God created everything out of nothing by the power of His Word. God spoke into existence everything that we see and everything that we experience. The power of God is that powerful. To be able to, to, uh, to speak about or to define or to, or to teach creation is a great test to the human intellect just to understand it. But there's so much more. Try explaining eternity to an eight-year-old. 
of God having no beginning and having no end, that God is from everlasting to everlasting. Try to explain that when you're lying on your son's bed as you say your last prayers and he asks that last question so he doesn't have to go to sleep on time. That is, that is a challenge to understand. What about God's time and God's timing? What about understanding how God answers prayers? When does He do it? Why doesn't He do it all the time in ways that I like or ways that I can understand? I think you see the point that there is so much in the Bible that is a challenge to us. That's why the Bible uses a phrase over and over pertaining to God's plan of salvation. It is called the mystery. The mystery. It is a hard thing to understand as it unfolds through the Word. But my friends, there is something in the Bible. Well, before we even go that far, you know, there was a holy man of God, a, a, an inspired man of God, a Holy Spirit-inspired man of God, that even he had to admit it that there were things that, that he did not understand about Scripture. Given the keys to the kingdom, Peter still struggled with some things that were being taught um, by godly people. Uh, he wrote this, 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 16. Peter wrote that Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand. And so if the inspired man struggles with some things in the Word, guess what? We are going to have our struggles now. There may be some things in the Bible that are hard to understand, but there has been consistently something that God has, God has revealed little by little and piece by piece and bit by bit through the Word. God has brought us the message that He is the Savior, that He is the Deliverer, and that He wants to save us from our sins. He makes it clear that He does not want us to, to suffer the, the consequences of our unforgiven sin. God has shown Himself to be a God of grace and mercy, a God of compassion in every uh, way and to whoever whom He wishes uh, to bless people with that. God wants to save mankind. It's been very, very clear that God will save us from our sins through and by His Son, Jesus. That is, again, the message of the Bible. So as we look at this, I simply want you to see in Old Testament and in New Testament to see just the basics of what God says about what it means to be delivered from sin or saved from sin. First of all, salvation in the Old Testament. It's not as hard as you think to understand it. We simply have to read, and we can, in our reading, see the various aspects of what salvation is all about. In the Old Testament, the word salvation simply means deliverance. In other words, God delivering other people, saving people from sins, but not just saving people from sins. God is constantly in the Old Testament. As you've read it, you'll understand that God constantly delivers people from danger. God has constantly delivered people from oppression and from oppressors. God has constantly delivered people from terrible sicknesses and diseases. And God releases them from the power of all that and delivers them to safety in whatever form God wants to give. God was also in the Old Testament constantly called upon to deliver His people from military threats like uh, the way He saved them and delivered them from the power of the Egyptians um, in the time of the Exodus? Or how many times have you read, especially in the Psalms, where David begged God to save Israel from their enemies, enemies that were everywhere, and God would deliver them from their enemies. But mankind, however, you and I, we all have a universal need for deliverance. 
There is a universal need for deliverance. That is the salvation of our souls and the forgiveness of our sins and the forgiveness from the effects of sin in our lives. The effect of what sin has on our souls. Sin kills souls. It damages Um, our lives. It takes us away from God. It keeps us from living forever with God. And God wants us so desperately to live forever with Him. This is one of the clearest teachings in the Old Testament. So forgiveness of sin uh, 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 was needed from the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3 and the very opening pages of our Bible. We see Adam and Eve, though given very specific instructions and standards and boundaries about how to live with God as their God and to live in the beautiful garden that God, is, God had created. God gave them simple instructions. I give you everything, but don't go near that tree. Don't touch that tree. Don't eat from that tree. Because the day that you do that, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will die. Die. Spiritually die because of their sin. And from then on, salvation is the common need and the common theme of your Bible and my Bible. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I want you to open your Bible to Leviticus, please. Leviticus chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. Leviticus 5, 17 through 19. Now I want you simply to listen uh, to the law of Moses that was given to God's people after the Exodus and after, after Moses has written everything that the law contained so that people would know how to live as God's people. Sin was addressed. And what God feels about it, what sin does to us, but also the great blessing that God has given mankind, that is the deliverance of it or from it and the forgiveness of sin. Leviticus 5, 17 through 19. If a person sins and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, even though he does not know it, he is guilty and will be held responsibility. And going into verse 19, the priest will make atonement for him for the wrong he has committed unintentionally and he will be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. He has been guilty of wrongdoing against the Lord. Now as you look at, those, look at that passage right there, there's some important things to, that show us what the, the common plight of mankind is. That when we sin, even if we don't know we have, we are guilty. We are guilty. We are guilty of of wrongdoing against the Lord, as the text says. And because we are guilty and when we do, when we engage in wrongdoing or sin against the Lord, God says you will be held responsible for your actions. We understand responsibility, do we not? It's not a very popular thing, it seems nowadays, to take responsibility for your actions, for your sins, or, or uh, even not sins, the mistakes that you made, but especially in sin. It's easy to blame someone else or to deny responsibility for what we do. But the great blessing that we see in here is that when a guilt offering to God is made, God says, I will forgive you. God wants to forgive us. And God has made a way that we, that though responsible and guilty, that we can be forgiven of our sins. Another wonderful blessing that we have is not just the law pointing out that if you make the, a guilt offering for your sins, whether you meant to do it or not, God will forgive you. But there is also a picture of God's uh, deliverance where the, the sinful person will make, uh, will, will own it and will confess their sin. This is a part of what God wants to see. And God has always been this way. Uh, Psalm chapter 51, the 51st Psalm. King David, knowing that he had sinned and knowing that he had sinned grievously 
uh, before His Father in heaven. He was guilty of, of intentional sin, not unintentional sin, of intentional sin. And He was going to be and had been and innocent people were made uh, to pay the price for His sin. But listen to what David wrote. This came from his heart. Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Then in verse 14, Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Owning up to our sins, confessing our sins. He asks God for mercy. He confesses that God is a God of unfailing love and that God is a God of compassion. He knows that God will blot out our transgressions, blot out uh, our sins, what does blot out mean? It means to atone. It means to cover up. Where God doesn't even see them anymore when He forgives them. He asks to be washed. He asks to be cleansed from His sins. He says it straight up. Save me from my blood guilt. He was guilty of murder, not just adultery. And so what do we find out? that when God saves, then we rejoice. We rejoice in the righteousness of God. And so not only does God find a way to save us and made the way to save us from our blood guilt, we need to be confessors of our sin. And when we are confessors of our sin, God will, will take that sin away. Now, Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 28. And in Nehemiah ch uh, chapter 9, verse 28, in Nehemiah, one of the th important things that Nehemiah did as he led uh, a portion of God's people back to Jerusalem to repair uh, the, the walls and the gates of a torn up, damaged, um, burned down city of Jerusalem, part of what he was trying to rebuild was the relationship between the sinful people of Israel and their good and gracious and forgiving God. And so what he did was he would pray and confess the national sins of God's people. Listen to what Nehemiah uh, said, talking about his people. They again did what was evil in your sight. Then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven, and in your compassion you've delivered them time after time. What is Nehemiah trying to point out? about their national history as the people of God. They were constantly sinning. They would be good for a while, but then they would fall into sin, and they would, God, to teach them a lesson, to, to make the responsibility be, uh, be very clear in their minds, God would allow the enemies um, near them to overrun them and hurt and abuse them. And then when they learned their lesson and they cried out to God again, we're speaking about the time of the judges, by the way, that God time after time would go in there and He would save them from their sin and deliver them uh, from what they were going through time after time. God delivers time after time. Why? Because time after time, we forget God. We sin against God. We live our own way. We do our own thing. And when we come to our senses and we repent of our sins, time after time after time, God shows Himself to be a forgiver and deliverer from sins and their sinful effect. So the theme then of the Old Testament is that God is a deliverer. God is a deliverer from sin. And in the Old Testament, God made clear uh, through the prophets that He was planning and looking forward to something that would affect you and I. That there, there was to be a coming king and a coming servant of God that would not only deliver people from sin, 
that he would also suffer the consequences for the guilty, though he was never guilty, not even once. Psalm chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Listen to what God says here. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son today. I have become your father. Looking forward to Jesus Christ. Isaiah was raised by God uh, to... to to turn the sinful people back to God before it was completely too late for them. And in in Isaiah chapter 53, where God talks about a suffering servant that will be raised up to deliver God's people from their sin, uh, he said these words, Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. This suffering servant, this king that will be installed, talking about Jesus, he took a He took up our infirmities and carried away our sorrows. Yet we considered Him stricken by God, smitten by Him and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His wounds we are healed. God delivers us from sin. Because He is a good and gracious and forgiving and merciful God. And He has planned for that King and that servant to come into this world so that we can have our sins also forgiven. The deliverance that God uh, has made the hallmark of His character uh, from the very beginning came to its fruition, into its fullness when Jesus Christ died on the cross. It was fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross. And so there are uh, lots of mysterious things in the Bible, right? Things that we don't understand. But if you read Matthew through Revelation, what is the constant story? That there is salvation in Jesus Christ the Lord. There is salvation and forgiveness, God's grace and God's mercy. There is eternal life uh, because of what Jesus did on the cross. Paul wrote to the Ephesian Christians and he told them this. Now these were already Christians, but he was better defining and teaching in depth after they became Christians um, everything that God had done from before the beginning to give them the salvation that they enjoyed. Ephesians 1, 7, verse 10, or through, uh, Ephesians 1, 7 through 10, uh, Paul writes, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Christ. From the very beginning, God was planning this salvation. But it's not just the salvation. There is a price that was paid. The blood of Jesus. What we recently, just a few minutes ago, remembered and thanked God for, that Jesus died for us, but also gave His blood to save us from our blood guilt. Redemption means that we were owned by our sins and owned by Satan. And by His own precious blood, Jesus paid the price and bought us back so that we can be set free. In that, we are forgiven by the blood that Jesus shed. There is salvation. And that is the story of the Bible. God is the deliverer and He delivers us through His Son and the blood He shed. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. As we build this short story about how God is the deliverer uh, from our sins. In Acts chapter 12, we have the the absolute uh, uh, rock solid teaching of who we need to put our faith in or who we need to look to for our salvation. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. 
And so it's very clear that God has uh, shown himself to be a deliverer, but he delivers us from our sin through his son and only his son. There is no one else. There is no other person. There is no other way. There is no other thing to believe. There's no one else or thing to look to that will save us and deliver us from sin. It is Jesus Christ. This is God's plan for us. So Jesus' ministry, His mission, was to save the world from sin. Now it may be surprising to you, but that very plain fact of why Jesus came is slowly but surely being eaten, not quite lost perhaps, but watered down so thoroughly that people forget why Jesus came. Let me tell you something. It's not a mystery if you read Matthew through uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus did not come simply for the blind to see. He did not come to wipe out leprosy from this world. God did not make everything right for Jesus to be born so that the lame could walk and that the deaf had their ears opened. Jesus came to save sinners, as Paul said, of whom we are the worst. My friends, that is why Jesus came. And so before Jesus was born, His mission was announced. He was to save His people from their sins. Right? Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Before Jesus was born, this is, this is Matthew's account. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Joseph. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." Before Jesus was born, his mission was made known to his earthly father, uh, Joseph. And, and Joseph had a very important part in the life of Jesus uh, to make sure that that boy knew what his mission was. Why was Jesus named uh, Jesus anyway, or Joshua, or Yeshua? Why? Because just like Joshua, Joshua was a type of Savior. And Jesus is the Savior of the world, saving people from their sins. Now, you know it's one of the most beautiful things about God's plan to deliver us and that God is a deliverer and God delivers us from our sin, the effects of sin through His Son. One of the beautiful things about this is that, that Jesus or salvation in Jesus and that mission to save us is an expression of God's love. Why does God save us? Why doesn't God just get rid of us? Why doesn't He just let us be held responsible even for those unintentional sins? It says, well, buddy, you're responsible for that. You take care of that yourselves. The Bible shows us is that God saves us through His Son simply because He loves us. Because He loves you. Because He loves me. That is why. You had it on the screen during the Lord's Supper. And I'm so glad that was the verse that Charles chose. Uh, John 3, 16 and 17. You've heard this, have you not? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. My friends, the story of the Bible, the story of mankind is God's saving and delivering us from our sin. He did it and He does it and He continues to, to deliver us simply because He loves us. And to fulfill God's mission uh, because of His love, to fulfill God's mission, Jesus not only died for us, He was proactive in His mission to save us. What do I mean by that? Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. When Jesus saved or, and, and, and showed, showed love and acceptance uh, to one of the scoundrels of his day, a dreaded tax collector um, who was hated by everybody, yet he was still a child of Abraham. He was still a Hebrew, still 
uh, a part of the nation of Israel, Jesus said this, The Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Seek and save. Not just waiting for you to come to Him. The Bible shows how God through His Son, through the Word, through the Spirit, that He is making the plea that He will save your souls. He will seek and save. Seek and save the lost. That is what Jesus' mission was. Now, just a couple more verses to consider before we have a good picture. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. The Hebrew writer wrote to Hebrew Christians, as I said before. And they left the law and they left the sacrifices and they accepted that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. But it was so hard for them because most of the Jews in that era did not, just like now, did not and now do not believe that Jesus was, Jesus of Nazareth, was the Messiah that was to come. But in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, the Hebrew writer is pleading with them to understand why Jesus came. Hebrews 1.3 reads that Jesus provided purification for sins. Provided purification for sins. Sins make you dirty. Sins will, will damage your soul, damage your relationship with God, make you unclean to be in the presence of God. Then the text says, after He provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. After providing purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Uh, what does that mean? On the cross, Jesus provided the way to be saved and then went back to sit at God's right hand. There is power in that thought. He fulfilled His mission. He paid for our sins with His life and with His blood. He has gone away to prepare heaven. He told us uh, that in John chapter John chapter 14, that that is why He went away to prepare a place for us to be. But there's also a very, very important message in this beyond that. There's also a sense that salvation is yet to come, not just enjoyed now. Let's see what it says. Salvation cannot be possible, folks, unless your sins are forgiven. You cannot be saved. You cannot go to heaven unless Jesus saves you. He is the only way to be saved. Unless our sins are forgiven, there is no salvation. Salvation, however, is not just the forgiveness of our sins in this life. There, it's way deeper and much greater than even that. And let me tell you something. I love living the life of a saved man because I know my sinful self. I know what I've been forgiven of. I know exactly what I still struggle with. I know exactly that, that tomorrow I will need the same type of cleansing from the blood of Christ as I have needed today and I have received yesterday. Such is the life of living in the flesh. And so I, it's a great way to live knowing that I am being forgiven in this life, that I can stand and pray and worship because I have been forgiven by Christ. But this is not the final blessing of salvation. This is not as good as it gets. This is not why Jesus came to forgive us just now in the flesh. There is so much more and it gets even better than that because the final blessing of God's salvation, what He planned before creation, was that we would live forever in Him in heaven. That is the final uh, gift. That is salvation in its fullness. That is the end result of Jesus dying on the cross and my belief and faith in Him by the grace of God. Hebrews 9.28 Hebrews 9.28 reads, Christ was sacrificed once to take away 
the sins of many people. And He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. What are you waiting for? I'm waiting for that day. I, want to, I look forward to that day. You might not, but there is a way that you can in that confidence that you can have in being saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. I love what Paul wrote to the Thessalonian Christians 1 Thessalonians 4.17, that when the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise on that great grand last day uh, when Jesus returns, He wrote, We who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them, those who had died in Christ, to, uh, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. That is the point of God's deliverance. Why is God the deliverer from sin? Because He wants us to live forever with Him. Why did He send Jesus so that our sins can be forgiven and we can live and be forever with the Lord. Now listen, there's so much more about salvation than just this. So many more things to learn, and we're going to learn a lot more. But I want you simply to keep this one thing in mind. God has not destined us. God has not destined you for wrath. That's not to be your future if you don't want it. God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what God wants for you. That is why God's the deliverer. That is why God has been the deliverer from before the creation and all the way through our time. Because He wants us to have salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's plan is to deliver us from His wrath that we so deserve because of our sin, because of our sinning against God. Uh, but through His Son, we have those sins forgiven. So my friends, at this point, I almost hesitate to give an invitation. Let me tell you why. Because we haven't got to how you can enjoy this. That All those lessons are coming up. But at this point right now, no. That God desires to save your soul. He has provided everything you need to be forgiven and to not fear that last day, not fear that, trump, that last trumpet or that, that the voice of the archangel as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. We never have to fear it if we are saved by His Son Christ. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, thank You for being our deliverer and for blessing us with, with the chance, with the opportunity to have our sins forgiven. Father, I pray for the response of anyone who wants to know more, or who needs prayers, or who needs uh, a blessing in one way or another. And I pray, Father, that we can help them with that. But Father, help us to know that You uh, want to give us salvation through Your Son. Father, bless anyone who needs to respond to this message. In Jesus' name, amen.